This is section 3.7 where we're going to talk about how TCP implements congestion control. The way the book organizes this is a neat way and we're really going to organize this discussion in terms of three questions. The first question is how does TCP perceive congestion? How does it know that congestion is going on? And the quick and easy answer to that is through an end-to-end -end basis. So TCP at the receiver um, at the sender and receiver is going to listen for lost packets, for failure kind of events. How does TCP limit the send rate? We're going to talk about how does TCP actually throttle itself? And then thirdly, how specifically should TCP change? How does it adapt to those losses? And we're going to talk about a, some of TCP's algorithms, additive increase, multiplicative decrease, AIMD, as the basic way to change the rate in response to congestion. The main idea is if the network is congested, right, the sender needs to slow down. We need to limit the send rate when the network is congested. So we need to figure out that the network's congested and then we need to slow the sender down. So question number one, how do we perceive congestion? TCP does it using an implicit end-to-end -end feedback mechanism. Implicit means there's no special packets that say, I'm congested. Instead, TCP is going to look at the packets, the sender is going to look at the packets that it gets back. If an acknowledgement is received, what does that tell us? What might we infer about congestion? So if the TCP, if the TCP sender gets an acknowledgement back, what does that say about congestion in the network? There doesn't seem to be any. Whereas if an acknowledgement is not received, what might that infer? What might that imply? The opposite, that, that there's some kind of loss going on, and maybe it's because the network is congested. What should the TCP sender do if, um, if an acknowledgement is not received? Just in general. It needs, it needs to cut back. It needs to slow down, not send so fast. Whereas if an acknowledgement is received, then it might say, hey, I could speed up a little bit and maybe there's some more available bandwidth out there that I could take advantage of. Second question, how do we limit the send rate? This is a pretty simple question. We're just going to limit the number of unacknowledged bytes in the pipeline. Remember the congestion window um, or the, the window size as we called it for the pipeline. So we're going to define a new variable called congestion window, CWND. It's sort of like the receive window for a flow control but this window size is just for the congestion. So we're going to limit so we're going to limit the sender to the minimum of the receive window and the congestion window. Does that make sense? So whichever one of those is smaller, C wind or R wind, that's what we can send out into the pipeline. That's our window size. Questions on that? Notice that C wind is different from R wind because the receive window is just based on how much buffer space the receiver has, whereas the congestion window as we're about to develop is going to change as a function of the network capacity that we infer from loss events and success events in sending. R window is what we talked about last time with flow control, um, which is it's a variable that TCP keeps to know this is how many bytes the receiver can receive with because that's how many bytes the receiver has in his buffer uh, that's available. Um, how do we limit the send rate? You can see kind of through here. If we send out C uh, congestion window bytes, this is the round trip time, and we get back an act that's basically empty, then our rate is the sending speed in bytes per second is essentially the congestion window divided by the round trip time. That's our rate if we care about rates. We can buy, so by controlling the congestion window size, we control the rate. Um, we're assuming that the round trip time doesn't change a lot. If it did though, that's okay because that's just going to kind of regulate itself. All right, the third question is kind of the hardest, which is how do you change the TCP rate? What algorithm, what function do you follow to change the rate? Our goal here is to transmit as fast as possible, but not, not any faster. 
right? That's like our, our goal all the time, right? When you're driving your car, set your goal, go as fast as possible, but not so fast that you're going to get in trouble. Um, so we want to, TCP senders want to find the rate just below the congestion level, right? If we cross over into the congestion area, then that's bad for everybody. But if we stay just underneath that, we get to send as fast as possible. I mean, you can imagine, right, one way to avoid congestion would be to slow everybody down to where they're sending it like, you know, like one byte per second. And sure, that would be, sure, that would avoid anybody congesting the network, but it wouldn't be a good use of the resources. Right, Camille? Does that hurt you? It hurts me, right? Um, so instead, well, instead, we're going to always be probing for more available bandwidth. And hopefully, if there is some, then we'll keep increasing and increasing. Can you imagine how this would work on, a, on the roads? It'd be cool, right? Because you'd be like, well, it's the middle of the night. Nobody's here, so I can drive faster because there's nobody else using the resources. Whereas, right, if you're in the middle of the day and there's lots of people out, then you'd all slow down and maybe you'd drive less than the speed limit. But if it was at night, then it would be faster. I think that'd be kind of cool, right? We could make our speed limit signs LED, and then they could change. So at night, it'd be like, hey, you know, 75 on Main Street. Um, that might not work as well as it does in networks, all right? So let's not, let's not get out of control there. Okay, so what TCP is going to do is something that looks kind of like this, bandwidth probing. All right, the sending rate is going to increase. Right, this is over time, and this is the sending rate. We're going to increase, increase until some loss event happens, like a lost packet. That's what these X's represent. And when the loss event happens, then we'll cut back, right? Because, ooh, we're in the congestion area. We need to make sure that everybody can send their packets through. And we're going to keep doing that until there's another loss event, all right? You see the kind of this sawtooth pattern where TCP is always probing for more available bandwidth. Does this graph make sense? This is sort of an intuitive description of what TCP does. It's more complicated than this, but this is uh, like the normal mode of operation in TCP. All right, so we're going to look at success events and loss events. A success event is an acknowledgement being received. What should we do if an acknowledgement is received? What word goes in that blank? Should we increase or decrease the congestion window? Increase, right? That means there's probably more bandwidth, so let's send faster. <clears throat> TCP has two modes. One is called slow start, and this is the mode that it's in at the beginning. Even though it's called slow start, it's actually fast. And in this case, the sending speed increases exponentially. This happens when you're just starting off or after a timeout. So initially, the congestion window is really, really small like one um, times the maximum, maximum segment size, which is the MSS is kind of the unit of measurement for a, a segment. It's the biggest size a segment can be. So, right, initially the congestion window is, really, is one that's super small, so we're going to double it every time we have a success event, right? One, two, four, eight, you get the picture. So this is nice because we're going to ramp up speed really fast, and we're going to do that until we get to this threshold called the slow start threshold. And that value is something that we found before um, by, because we've been running, or it has like a default initial value if we're beginning a connection. The second phase, the second mode, is called congestion avoidance, and it's more of the normal operation mode. In this case, um, the congestion window increases linearly. So we kind of increase it by one each time which is akin to that graph we just saw with the sawtooth. Um, mm -hmm. So that, those are our two main modes, slow start, con congestion, avoidance. Questions on this? This is what we do if an acknowledgement is received. We increase the congestion window in one of these two ways, either exponentially or linearly. If we're in normal mode, it's linear. All right, what happens if there's a loss event? What do we do to congestion window? Decrease, right? That makes sense. We've got to cut it. How much do we cut it? Well, we're going to consider two different loss events. One loss event is a timeout, right? That means that a, the, the transmission timeout expired. In that case, we're going to do something really drastic. 
we're going to cut the congestion window to one. That's one maximum segment size um, if you care about those details. So this ends up putting us back in, in slow start, which we just talked about. All right, so timeout means bad stuff's going on, cut back drastically. In contrast to that is the triple duplicate act, which we've mentioned in this class before. All right, if you get three acts for the same packet number, we're going to cut the congestion window in half. So you see that's not as drastic, but it's still pretty drastic, right? So instead of going to one, we cut it in half. Okay, let me show you how this works kind of a little bit more graphically. Um, you can imagine initially we're at one, so we send one segment. Um, when we get the acknowledgement back, we send two segments. You see when we get that, we send, um, we double that to four and so forth. So this is in slow start mode. We're going to double the congestion window every round trip time until some loss event occurs or until we reach the slow start threshold. So the variable is called SS thresh. It's the slow start threshold. It's the, a variable that's maintained by TCP that says this is the speed at which I want to switch from slow start to congestion avoidance mode. So I'm going to stop being crazy fast and doubling the speed and just increment by one each time, each round. When we, um, when we have a loss event on a timeout, we take half of, this, half of the rate that the last congestion, um, the congestion event occurred, and we store that as the slow start threshold. So the slow start threshold is half the sending rate on a timeout. <clears throat> and like I said, we're going to switch from slow start mode where we're doubling, exponentially increase, to congestion avoidance where it's linear when the congestion window is greater than or equal to the threshold. Now let's consider how TCP's congestion avoidance mode operates. Recall that congestion avoidance mode is sort of the normal operation of TCP, and this is the mode that TCP is in when the congestion window is greater than the slow start threshold. In this case, the congestion window increases by one maximum segment size bytes per round trip time. Notice that this is a lot slower than slow start. Why is that? Well, the answer is because congestion avoidance is much less aggressive. It's much more conservative in probing for bandwidth. It's trying to avoid excessively congesting the network. The way that this is implemented is the congestion window increases by the maximum segment size divided by the congestion window seen here for every acknowledgement that's received. Let me show you how all these different modes connect with each other and show you a new mode. TCP congestion control uh, can be summarized in this state transition diagram. Note, we've talked about these two modes, slow start and congestion avoidance. The third state, fast recovery, I mean, we'll talk about in just a moment. Notice the relationships between these modes. In slow start is where we start. That's what this dotted line means. When the congestion window is greater than the, the slow start threshold, we move into congestion avoidance and do that more conservative approach. If there is a timeout, we go back to slow start, which is going to severely decrease the congestion window. It's going to decrease it down to one. And then we're going to increase exponentially. The new mode is called fast recovery, and it's sort of a in-between mode. So if congestion avoidance is very conservative, slow start is very aggressive, fast recovery is sort of moderate. It's in, it's in the middle. If three duplicate acknowledgments are received, which that is indicative of some kind of loss, we'll go into fast recovery. When we get a new acknowledgement, we'll move back to congestion avoidance. If we're in fast recovery and when there's a timeout, that kind of loss will go back to slow start and be very conservative. Um, if there are three duplicate acts from slow start, we'll go to fast recovery. So fast recovery is going to increase the congestion window faster than we would um, in slow start. I'm sorry, it's going to increase the congestion window more conservatively, but it's not going to be cut as much when we enter it. 
The main thing I want you to take away from this discussion of TCP's congestion control is AIMD, additive increase, multiplicative decrease. As acknowledgments are received, that is, as success events happen, we're going to increase the congestion window by one MSS per round trip time. This is an additive increase, and this is more conservative. If there's a loss event, which means a non-timeout detected loss, we're going to cut the congestion window in half. So this is a multiplicative or divisive, I suppose, decrease. So loss events are going to cause us to cut in half. Let me show you how that looks graphically using this diagram from the book. What we see here is two versions of TCP, but they're the same for the most part. TCP Reno in black is the more common implementation of the algorithm. So notice that in the beginning here we're doubling from 1 to 2 to 4 to 8. We're going to say that the slow start threshold is at 8. Once we cross that slow start threshold, we move from slow start mode into congestion avoidance. At that point, you see we increase linearly. When there's a loss event in TCP Tahoe, we go back to 1. TCP Reno, however, is not as strict, and it's just going to cut the, cut the congestion window size in half. So we go from 12 down to 6, at which point we continue in, in congestion avoidance additive increase. So what we see here illustrated graphically is the multiplicative decrease, cutting it in half, and the additive increase. What really is going on here is, at this point, there is a triple duplicate ACK event, and this is fast recovery going on. So fast recovery means we cut in half and we increase linearly. Let me show you this one more way graphically. Notice, if the congestion window is less than the threshold, what mode are we in? We're in slow start. So that's what's happening here. We've got slow start here with the doubling after being set back to one. If the congestion window is greater than the slow start threshold, then we're in congestion avoidance, as shown here. So when there's a timeout, the congestion window is set to one. When there's a triple duplicate act, the, the congestion window is, is set to about half of what it was. And we do remember that half value as the new slow start threshold. So to sum up, TCP congestion control responds to the following two loss events in this way. If there's a triple duplicate act, we set the slow start threshold to the half the congestion window and then set the congestion window to that same value, about half of what it was. When there's a timeout, we remember the slow start threshold to be half of that congestion window, but we set the congestion window to just one. Take it all, about, all the way back to one.